This is Damian Macy, representing the Marshall Public Library, the Friends of the Library, and our Oral History Project. And today is Wednesday, March the 15th of 2016. What? June the 15th. June, I'm sorry, June the 15th of 2016. And I am in the uh, library meeting room with a local resident here, Betsy Harlow. And I know she has some stories to tell us, and we're looking forward to that. I'll introduce you, and here is Betsy. Hello. Um, I was born to Charles Herbert Tucker, the youngest of four boys. Uh, the third in line had died of what they just called the fever. They didn't have a name for it. His father laid out the town of Benham, Kentucky. He was a mining engineer, and he laid out the town for uh, the mines and for the steel mill that was there. What was the name of it? Benham. Benham. B-E-N-H-A-M, hmm. Kentucky. I was disappointed. My sister and I went down there, and it's really nothing. I mean, you know, the mine's close, and the steel mills are gone, and it's the museum, and that's in the superintendent's house, and that's about it. I mean, you know, it's other houses, too, but... They have a small college there, a junior college, hmm. and they had all kinds of cabinets with documents uh, that my grandfather had signed um, in pen. Um, I'm sure a dipped pen, <laughs> you know, the old style. Um, and uh, Kathy and I looked through them, my sister and I looked through them, and it was just amazing. It was run-of-the-mill stuff. How many windows do you want in the laundry room? We need to put stoves in the homes for our miners because this other mine is putting stoves in theirs and if we don't we're going to lose our best miners. You know it was just run-of-the-mill everyday stuff. But, but very it, significant to the history of what was happening then. Yes and it was very interesting. Luckily grandmother had taken a lot of pictures and I had those pictures. So and it was when the, the uh, town was being laid out, when the steel mill was being built, um, as the mine was coming along and so on, you know. What so, year would that have been? Oh, the land. That I can't tell you. Well, Dad was born in, in um, 15. So it would have been in that period mm -hmm. of time. Um, so I left those with the museum, and they yeah. were just thrilled. I mean, sure. they didn't mean anything to us, they were just pictures. But to them, it showed the progression of how the steel mill had, had come along and how the town had come along and so on. So they were thrilled to death uh, to have yeah. them. So that was neat. My mother um, was, get this, Wainona or Willa Hardigan Tucker. When we, my first husband and I went to get our driver, our marriage license, uh, she said father's name, and I told her Charles Herbert Tucker. She put that down, and I, and she said mother's name, and I laid that one on her, and she said, "How do you spell that?" I said, "I really don't know. I've never seen it in print, but we're going to try." Uh, or Willa was a family name, and Waynona came from the fact that uh, grandmother had wanted twin boys and they were going to be named Wayne and Willie. Her husband's name was Wayne, and he was killed in a railroading accident when mom was 10 days old. Um, the engineer, he was a, a switchman, and the engineer moved the train before he'd cleared the switch, cut off one of his legs at the hip, and almost cut off the other one at the hip, so naturally he died in the hospital very quickly from loss of blood. I can't imagine the pain. I, it just blows me away. Um, I was born in Miami, Florida. That's where God intended for me to be. He didn't intend for me to be up here in the cold. <laughs> um, and I like to say, no, I can't, I can't, I can't say that on a recording. I'll tell you that later. Uh, <laughs> but when we lived in Miami, it was wide open, you know, um, you could drive along Key Biscayne Boulevard for miles and miles and miles and see nothing but ocean and beach. Um, it was just wonderful. And now you see concrete. And, and yeah, lots no, of I don't. Buildings. I don't go there. I don't go there at all. Um, I don't even want to think about going there. I want to remember it like it was. Yes. We left there when I was twelve, but in the meantime, 
uh, mom had Kathy, my sister, and I wanted a sister so badly. And uh, I was seven by the time Kathy was born. And I got one of my first remembered whippings that day because I was so excited. I was jumping up and down on the bed and Dad said, quit jumping. And I was so excited I couldn't quit jumping. <laughs> so I got a whipping. Just one good swat on the butt and that took care of that. Um, <laughs> and about two years later then she had Herb, the next child in line. He was named for Dad, as you can tell, uh, Charles Herbert II. Uh, we called him Herb, um, and six years later, by the time then we had moved to Indiana, she had Wayne, my youngest brother, Horace Wayne, who now goes, has been Wayne all his life, and now goes by Horace, but that's another whole horse of a different color. <laughs> he started a new life, so he changed his name. Um, we went from Miami, Florida to a little town that I say forgot to shoe the horse and he ran away. <laughs> Just a little town, West Plains, Missouri. Now from Florida? From Florida. You came to West Plains, Missouri? Mm -hmm. Because my mother's mother and stepfather lived there and the doctor had told her mother that she only had six months to live. She had a bad heart. She was a nurse and a very obstinate person. That's probably where I get my stubborn tendencies. <laughs> she told him she would outlive him and he got struck by lightning on a golf course and she lived another 15 years. So once it became pretty obvious that dad wasn't gonna find decent work in that little town um, and grandmother had no intention of dying, they moved to Indianapolis. We first lived in a little rental house in Claremont. Um, and by that time, Dad's mother had become blind. And so we went back down to Florida and, and got her and brought her up with us. And she lived with us for the next 17 fun-filled years. Um, <laughs> and that's a whole other story because Grandmother was aristocratic, southern genteel, who felt that um, blacks were children, they had to be cared for like children, well, but cared for like children, um, and the South would rise again. She was a dyed-in-the-wool Methodist. So here's a woman who's taking care of her the other two brothers' wives would not have grandmother in her house. So here's the woman who's taking care of her for 17 years, who started out like life as a Catholic, who had no money, had not come from a family with money, no prestige, and a northerner to boot. Uh, so you talk about two people who were opposed. She was one of those Yankees. Oh, yes, she was. But she was a Yankee who took care of her until the day she died. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting household, I'll say that. I think so. <laughs> um, let's see, we moved from Claremont up to a uh, house in North Tremont. They decided they'd still be paying that house off when Dad was dead and gone, so they sold that and built a house out in Avon. And my sister and brother uh, went to Avon High School and Sister, I think, and Herb, Kathy and Herb both graduated from Avon High School. While we were living on North Tremont, I went to my freshman year to Broad Ripple High School. Okay. But Broad Ripple was so big even then, I couldn't know everybody in my math class, let alone everybody in my freshman class. And the township, Washington Township, did not have a high school at that time. So they paid your tuition for you to go to whatever high school you chose. Hmm. Well, the school bus for Broad Ripple went this way at the corner, and the school bus for Pike went this way at the corner. So I went to Pike the rest of my time. And it was a wonderful change, a wonderful change. 
there's two teachers that stand out in my mind from that experience. And one of them was Mrs. Hunt. She was an English teacher. And she had a pet peeve about ending sentences with prepositions. And, you know, high school kids, sometimes deliberately somebody would do it. Sometimes accidentally, but sometimes deliberately. And she'd say, what's my rule about prepositions? And our response was, a preposition is not a good thing to end a sentence with. And she'd just shake her head. <laughs> she was one of these people who was a lady. And you didn't have to You didn't have to be told. She just was. The other one was Mrs. Brown. Now, Mrs. Brown taught math. She was kind of an opposite to Mrs. Hunt because she was feisty. Um, small in stature, her husband was a mortician. Um, and she wore her hair pulled back in a bun and big clunky shoes and uh, always kind of looked austere, but she was a sweetheart. Um, and everybody said, watch out for old Lady Brown, she's mean. I found her just to be the opposite because when I told her that I didn't understand something we were doing, uh, but my dad was trying to help me, and she said, well, that's good. And, and uh, she said, let me know if you need any more help. And I got something wrong, and she said, I thought you said your dad was trying to help you, and he was a good mathematician. I said, he is. He works four to midnight, and he takes his lunch hour and sits mm -hmm. in the phone booth, and we work out my math problems, him in the phone booth and me in the phone. Oh, child, she said, when do you have a study period? And I told her, and uh, from then on, my study period was our time to work on math problems. And you know, I think some of our most difficult teachers and the ones that really were disciplinarian ones are the ones we remember. We remember, yeah. Because they got something across that we learned. Yeah. Mrs. Hunt was such a character though because one day she was called to the phone. And you know, high school kids, we're not gonna be quiet too long. Um, and they, there was a fellow in the next room named Mr. Chavon. Mr. Schoen was ex-military and thought the school classroom should be run like the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he came over and was standing at our door telling us how we should behave. And we heard Mrs. Brown coming down the hall, clunk, 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 those little shoes. And she walked very quickly. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, we kind of we're looking, you know, this way. Here she stands with her arms crossed. <laughs> and she didn't say a word. And she said, uh, finally, Mr. Chavon figured out, What's, what are they looking at? He turned around and saw her. He said, oh, Mrs. Brown, he said, I was just uh, doing some discipline here with your kids. And she said, Mr. Chavon, when I need your assistance, I will call on you. And she stepped right around him and into the room. <laughs> We loved it because we didn't like him anyway. She was in control. Yes, yes, she was, and and you knew it. <laughs> Were those a couple of your favorite subjects, English and math? You know what, science and math were my two favorite subjects, and I love science and math to this day. Those were my two favorite subjects to teach, and uh, I did a lot with uh, experiments with science because science is in the world; it's not in a textbook. It's in the world. And if you can bring that world out of the textbook to the different styles of learning, then you're reaching more kids. That's why it has some meaning then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had one young man whose mother was our secretary, and uh, Brad Hammersley, and he'd never liked science. He hated science. And we had a thing called a bioscope, which is just simply a large microscope uh, lit and you can project images on a screen. Well, I got a drop of pond water and put it on a concave slide and put it on that bioscope. And Brad was fascinated by science from then on. He loved science. And he would tell his mom, now when Mrs. Harlow needs that pond water, tell her to get a hold of me. 
I'll bring her some pod water. So. Got a little squirmy thing around oh there. Oh my, I said, now we know why we don't drink pod water. <laughs> exactly. And we don't drink it out of the creek either. Did you have some, uh, you had moved here apparently several places in your youth. Did you have some duties around home or chores that were uh, required? My main duty was to be responsible for my sister and my two brothers. I was the caregiver. Okay. Uh, my sister to this day says I'm the mother she wishes she had because mom did not like Kathy. I don't know why. We've never figured out why. I don't know that mom knew why, but she did not like Kathy. Hmm. And she would say, take Kathy with you. She'll mind you. Well, she followed me around like a tail on a puppy dog. <laughs> and to this day, we're best friends. Great. Um, just love her to death. Um, and then, of course, Mom got pregnant with Herb when Kathy was still quite young. It was two years between them. Not quite two years, as a matter of fact. Um, and she had a hard time carrying Herb. Um, so I kind of watched after. And then when Herb was born, added another one to my list. I had to wait six years for Wayne. Uh, Those uh, years in high school, and uh, obviously they carry some memorable times. To oh, yeah. You. Do you recall any particular experience that was your favorite memory of high school? Oh, my gosh. Well, of course, I did a lot of babysitting in high school. When I babysat, it was 35 cents an hour. I wonder what it is now. It scares me. Um, Yeah, meeting my dearest friend, who is my dearest friend to this day. Uh, she was a freshman, I was a sophomore when I transferred to Pike. And we lived, I lived here and she lived here, so we would walk one another home halfway. And then we'd stand and talk there for a while, unless it was really bad weather. Um, and my parents got their house finished, the Avon house finished, and moved. Uh, two weeks before graduation. Mm. So I stayed with Donna and her parents for that two weeks so I could finish at Pike. Oh, and my younger daughter is named Donna for my friend Donna. So So you graduated from Pike High School yeah, in, in 1956. 56. It was good a grand year. old year. It was a good year. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was a grand old year. Um, when we lived there, it's funny when you go back, I've gone back to that house where we lived when I was going to Pike, and of course the trees grow such a great degree in 30 some years, you know, uh, more like 50. But anyway, uh, the house seemed small, you know, I, it was big when we were there, but it's just kind of the same experience with my sixth graders would come back for something that was going on at, at Ernie Pyle School where I taught. And they'd say, how did we ever fit in these desks? So we, were, we weren't quite this size then, <laughs> we were a little smaller. It seemed like when we were young, any building, even the high school, it seemed so mammoth and huge. But when you got older, it seemed like it really shrank. <laughs> yeah, wasn't any big, not any big deal. Um, our, our sixth graders, and this is kind of jumping, but. Our sixth graders, uh, for a, a time, went to the middle school, which was the old high school, because uh, South Vermont had built a new high school. So then the middle school, and it was just seventh and eighth graders, it wasn't sixth yet, uh, went to the old high school, and they were scared to death to go to that old high school, because this Ernie Pyle was two wings all on one floor, and you know they didn't know anything different, most of them. And they'd go look at that big high school and they'd, and they'd come to me and say, oh, Mrs. Harlow, will you please come go with me? I'm scared to go to that school. And I said, you know, I'd love to, but I've been so busy helping you guys, I flunked. Oh, they just love that. I'm sure. So, but, uh, so from uh, high school, what was your, your next step? Did you go on for education then? Um, my next step was to Eastern Airlines. Really? When there was an Eastern Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, I worked reservations, phone, 
hired in at an unheard of rate of $75 a week. Wow. That was amazing. And in eight months, I was making $90 a week. So that was amazing, too. Is that um, in Indianapolis? That was in Indianapolis, downtown. I loved it. It had its moments. Um, you worked a swing shift, and I was on the um, 11 to 7 shift. And after about 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't have anything to do. You know, you've, you've checked all the waiting lists, and you've moved people around, and done all, it, plane, no planes coming in or going out. So you're just kind of there. And the phone rang, and I thought, oh, boy. And I picked it up and said, Eastern Airlines Reservations, may I help you? And this man's voice said, have you ever talked to a crazy person? I thought, okay, I've been up too long. And I said, excuse me? And he repeated it. And I said, no, sir, I don't think I ever have. And he said, well, you have now. Click. <laughs> I had a guy who claimed to be a brain surgeon who had to be in Atlanta for brain surgery the next day from Indianapolis. Fine, we can get him there. He said, I also need a seat for my dog. I said, sir, the dog cannot go in the regular airline seats. My dog is well behaved, my dog this and that and the other thing. And I kept trying to explain to him. And we couldn't possibly do it because all the transportation for animals was stored in Atlanta. So it would have to come up to Indianapolis and then be put on the plane to go back to Atlanta. Well, if my dog can't go, I'm not going. And he hung up. <laughs> you never know. And just about the time you're ready to pull your hair out, you think these people are absolutely nuts. Um, you'll get some sweet little old lady or some sweet little guy who wants to go out to California to see their children and, oh, as long as I can get there sometime after five o'clock so they can pick me up, that's fine. And you go, okay, I can do this. But I'll bet it's, it's even hairier today. Oh, I, it scares me to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fearless. <laughs> um, neighborhood. We didn't have too many neighbors. I had one neighbor who lived across the street who was a honk, went to high school with me, wasn't interested in me, turned out to be gay, but he was a, a good-looking kid. Uh, it's a chores, my, like I said, my main chore was watching after my sisters and brothers. I had dishes to do and, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing, vacuuming every once in a while, gals, kinds of stuff. And any time mom didn't want to do the ironing, I got to do the ironing. And back then, you know, you used a lot of starch and everything yeah. had to be ironed. And I'll swear, Damien, I think my clothes could have stood up by themselves. <laughs> Mom thought if a little starch was good, a lot was better. better. <laughs> so, oh, uh, hate, I hate ironing to this day. So um, did you have, uh, in, in your Eastern work then, were you living out on your own, or were you living at home yet? I was still living at home. home. Okay. <clears throat> um, but I knew I want. I I knew from the fifth grade that I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. I had a fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Campbell. Um, obviously, I've never forgotten her. Uh, she and her husband wanted children and couldn't have any, and they adopted nine. Oh my. Not only did they adopt nine, but they took them off the streets out of severe abuse wow. situations. That'd be a real challenge. Oh yeah, and she was up for it. She was up for it. She was a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And like I say, she's the reason that I decided to be a teacher. Um, and so uh, Eastern Airlines was downsizing. I wanted to go to college, so I was a good choice and came over to Indiana State. It was Indiana State Teachers College at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know caves have just formed around me when I say that, but anyway. Uh, I couldn't afford tuition and living quarters. So um, one of mother's math teachers who had become a pastor, and we had found him in Indianapolis, Ralph Paul Moore Jones. You're not going to find too many with that kind of moniker. Um, he announced in church that one of his former students 
children was looking for some place to live. And that was pretty common at Indiana State, and some of the kids got into really bad situations where they were doing all the washing and the cleaning and the minding the kids. They didn't have time to study. They had to drop out of school because they didn't have time to study. I moved in with the family, um, Mr. Wright and his mother, Granny, uh, and I, I'm sure if the devil had ever come to Granny, she would have given him a map and a key and told him where to go. <laughs> her husband broke up stills during the Prohibition, Ooh. and she never locked her door. She wasn't afraid of anybody. Mm -hmm. But she fell in at 60-some to trying to take care of a not-quite-two-year-old girl, a six-year-old girl, and a ten-year-old boy, because Bill's wife had been killed in an auto accident mm -hmm. that summer, and she needed help. Granny needed help. So I came and stayed in the room with Granny and helped her with the kids and with dinner, but pretty much I moved from home to home, you know? It was just an easy transition. Um, and that's the way it was my freshman year. Sophomore year, the summer of sophomore year, before sophomore year, um, Bill remarried. And she had two children by former marriage. So that took us up to five. And Janie said, don't leave me now. <laughs> she said, I need you. So in the fall of my sophomore year, I came back and stayed with them. Um, during that year, toward the spring, uh, my college friend, Carolyn, and I had decided we'd like to be out on our own. And her grandparents, she lived with, <clears throat> excuse me, she lived with her grandparents. And uh, so I talked it over with Janie and Bill, yeah, then they'd be okay. I hated to see me go. Her great-grandmother had lived in a little one-room building that was up at the end of the driveway of her grandparents' house. And they lived on a lake, so it was quite a driveway. Had electricity, but didn't have any plumbing. So we had an outhouse. Um, that was my second experience with an outhouse. The first one was in Missouri. Um, and we had a well. And we'd always forget to get water until it was almost dark, and here we are, each one of us with a pail and another one between us, slopping water going down the driveway, laughing at ourselves. Um, we stayed there the rest of my sophomore year, and that's during that period when I met and married my first husband. And he was Gerald Rader. Gerald. Rader. Rader. R-A-D-E-R. And it was by him that I had my three wonderful kids. Um, Diana was born on Valentine's Day in 60. And Donna, in two weeks short of Valentine's Day in 62. And Kevin in November of 63. So I had my hands full. Uh -huh. It was pretty obvious that I wasn't gonna be able to go back to school with a little one and then two little ones and then three little ones. I did go to work at uh, Roots when it was downtown. I went as Christmas help and they asked me to stay. So uh, I rode the bus and worked at Roots. And Roots had a rule that you couldn't be pregnant if you worked there. And we had just the two girls at that time, and I was pregnant with Kevin. And uh, I went in and said, I'm going to have to quit. And they said, well, aren't you satisfied with this? Said, well, well, what have we done? I said, oh, no, I love my job very much. But I said, I'm expecting. Oh, when's oh. the baby due? This was in August. He was actually due in October. And uh, he decided to stay another month. Lazy kid. <laughs> um, October, they're going, September. What? <laughs> you know? And I'd worn shirt waist dresses and really didn't show that much. So they didn't want to hear that, though. Well, okay, we'll get your paycheck ready for you. 
know, so that was the end of Roots and I. Were you in sales there? Um, I was. I started out with Christmas help in uh, colognes and that sort of thing. Uh, when they asked me to stay, the gal that they had for making signs was so far behind that the sales were passed before she could get the signs made. <laughs> and I knew nothing about how to operate a press, but I knew it worked backwards. So they asked me if I'd be interested in making signs, sales signs. So I went up there. When Terre Haute had the big fire mm -hmm. and that whole block burnt practically, um, that's where I was working up on the fifth floor. Mm. And I could see out that window and see all that damage. The windows were broken up there from the fire, from the heat of the fire. The Roots was a very distinctive store. And oh, yes. Beautiful merchandise. Oh, yes. Quite, quite large for Terre Haute. I filled in <coughs> in a lot of places. I, I got caught up on the signs so fast they didn't have enough signs for me to make. So um, I worked the elevator. I filled in lunch hours. Did kind of jack of all trades. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And if I didn't know how to do it, there was somebody else there that could tell yeah. me. You know, I was just a body, and I could say, "Can I help you?" Um, but second floor, <laughs> third floor. Um, Ready to wear. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, and we had fabrics back in that day too, you know, that's when it was reasonable to sew, it's not reasonable to sew anymore. And I sewed just about everything the kids and I wore, except our underwear, for many, many years. Uh, from layettes up. Um, and really enjoyed sewing. Um, and Gerald and I were living in an apartment and the apartment wasn't available anymore. So we moved to a little garage that we fashioned into a small house with the three kids. And we bought two lots across the street, tore down five houses and two garages, sure. cleaned all the salvageable lumber. I cleaned a lot of square nails, let me tell you. Um, and built by hand a 28 by 56 foot house. They don't make them anymore, but at that time they made three cell cement blocks mm -hmm. and I could pick up two of them and walk away with them all day long and did. Part of the reason I'm in the shape I'm in now. Uh, my back is shot. The back spa the spinal specialist I saw last compared it to a rotten fence post. <laughs> Not only that, but he added that there was a uh, you see a squirrel living in it and a woodpecker knocking on it. Oh, gosh. I told him not to quit his day job. <laughs> I love it. He was funny. Um, as to dating, I wasn't allowed to date until I was 15. And uh, you will be home at such and such a time. Curfew. Uh, I was only five feet tall at that time. I'm going back to five feet tall now. Um, and I dated a guy who was 6'6". Six, six. Uh, and he was quite a joker. And he and mom and, dad, and mom and dad remained friends all their lives, all his life. He died before they did, strangely. Um, but he set me up on an ottoman one time at his parents' house and wasn't going to let me down. <laughs> He said, now you're the right height. And I got aggravated. I'm Irish. I'm a lot Irish. And I kicked him in the shin. And I kicked him hard enough that he bore a scar of that kick all of his life, and it drove his wife nuts. <laughs> she didn't like it at all. Too much of a reminder, huh? I guess. <laughs> but she married him. I didn't. But he was, he was um, a senior. Uh, when we were dating, and he was ready to get married and settle down. Mm -hmm. And I would think I was a sophomore, and that just wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. My dad had shot him with a shotgun. <laughs> so um, I dated one fella, the two fellas, that I'd really like to know what happened to. They respect, you know, you get to a point in your life where you just like to know if these people are okay. Yeah. 
because uh, they were meaningful in your life at that time. Um, one I dated for three years and one about a year. Um, I don't know what happened to either one of them. They don't know what happened to me either, so I guess it's fair. <laughs> Your experience at Roots sounds rather interesting. So from there, did somewhere you wander back into the classroom and school? Um, yeah. While we were building our house, I never take things in small doses. While we were building our house, and I was taking care of Gerald's mother, who was an invalid, and the three kids, and working at Roots, I went back to school. Uh, my advisor said, you have to finish in this frame of time because the catalog's gonna change again and you're gonna lose a lot more credits. I had had uh, enough special education classes that I had a minor in special ed, but by the time I went back, those classes that had been uh, four hours had changed to two and three hour classes. Mm -hmm. You see, when I started in Indiana State, it was only $44 for a, a term. It wasn't a semester, it was a term. And when they raised it my sophomore year to $66, we all thought we'd been robbed. Now you couldn't buy an hour for that. Oops. Not a half an hour. So um, Keeps going. Yes, yes. So I went back to school then. And so you were majoring in education then? Yes, that yes. One. That was elementary with a minor in special. Um, and because of Mrs. Campbell, I had to be a teacher. Um, so got the degree in 70 and went to an interview with South Vermilion and was hired almost on the spot. I, was, I went to the interview on Monday. They had a school board meeting on Tuesday, and they okayed me on Tuesday, and uh, I started that fall. So I started in the fall of 70 at Ernie Pyle School. 37 sixth graders. And most of them were taller than I am. Mm -hmm. And I'd gotten up to 5'3 by that time. <laughs> um, Wonderful, wonderful kids. I loved kids. I loved teaching. Was that, you say, sixth grade? Sixth grade. I spent 25 years in sixth grade. I could not pass. <laughs> Just kept staying right there in sixth grade. And I loved it. I mean, I, a lot of the teachers switched around from fourth grade to third grade, you know, switched around. I didn't want to switch around. So I your 26 it. years were at the Ernie Pyle School then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 25 years. Okay. We're at Ernie Pyle, all at Ernie Pyle. And they kept moving me in the different rooms because at that time they still had seventh and eighth graders out there. I hired in under one of the most wonderful principals you could ever imagine, John Nelson. He loved kids, just absolutely loved them. He was a teacher who had become a principal. He never forgot he was a teacher. He never forgot that there were kids in the building. And he would put a slip of paper on the counter in the office, eat with Mr. Nelson. It was limited to two kids. And they could sign up, and they could come in and eat lunch with Mr. Nelson. And they just sat and talked about anything. He could stand at the door of the office as the kids passed by to go to the gym, which was also the cafeteria, big school. Uh, and talk to practically every kid he could catch. And he could say, what do you think of that new little brother? What do mom and dad think of that new car? Hey, how are you getting along with, what do you think about the Cubs this year? Aren't they, they're not gonna do Right anything. down to their level yes. and their interests. Yes, wasn't. yes, because he'd eat lunch with most of them. Mm -hmm. He knew them, he knew them. He had the audacity to retire. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they sent us another one, who shall remain nameless. Uh, he didn't know there was a kid in the building. He didn't care there were kids in the building. Now, he could get money for projects. He knew how to write grants. He was so good at being a principal that they made him an assistant superintendent, and then they made him a superintendent, and then they told him to retire. 
obviously an administrator, but not a people person. He was not a teacher. He was not a principal. No. He was, yeah. Those who teach can, and those who can't administer. I know that's a take on an old <laughs> saying, but um, that's a, the way it worked. So when you graduated from Indiana State, you say 1970? Mm -hmm. That had become Indiana State University at that right. time? Okay, right. so there were some changes in there. Uh-huh, it had. Mm -hmm. um, so I started, in it, and I had classes on my uh, list that they didn't even offer anymore. I had Math 101E, they didn't even offer, offer Math 101E anymore. So I had to take Math 101 and Math 102. Um, so did you do student teaching then in the lab school that was there? No, I did student teaching at Collett School. Collett in Terre Haute, mm -hmm. yeah. Not even there anymore. No. Um, and my supervising teacher told me in my second day that I was there, Betsy, we must beware of perfection at all times. And I thought, oh lady, you've missed the boat here. Because <laughs> you haven't got perfection at all right here. <laughs> the only perfect person I ever heard of was hung on a cross and walked on water. That's right. That's not me. <laughs> uh, she was not a teacher either. Her kids were so afraid of her that they would not understand something and not ask a question. Afraid to ask. Rather than ask her and be yelled at. She had me keep, now this, mind you, I'm, I'm still working on a house. No, I guess we had the house done by that time. Um, I'm still working with three kids, an invalid mother-in-law, a husband who did nothing. She had me keep a lesson plan book, a daily lesson plan book, a weekly lesson plan book, a unit lesson plan book, mm. and a book of something I observed each and every day. That's four books. She had me teaching. You were supposed to ease into it. You were supposed to come in and have two weeks where you just kind of picked up a class here mm -hmm. and there. She had me teaching from the second day I was there until I, the last day I was there because you were supposed to ease out in the last two weeks too and give her back to the, the regular teacher. Um, and I didn't care much for her and her style. Gee, what a surprise. Um, it didn't discourage you from teaching though. Please. No, no, because one of the days when I wrote an observation, and she, she looked at all these books, she checked them over while I was teaching, she checked them over. Um, and one of these days in my observation book, I had written, uh, Mrs. X had a cold today and wasn't her usual self, but I'm sure none of the students noticed because the quality of her teaching did not vary. Hey, it was the truth. <laughs> it didn't vary. It was the same. And she wrote, wonderful observation. Glad you noticed. And I thought, I can, I can do anything, you know, I can say anything. That's true. I've got her. So. Uh, do you remember, I guess, being on the campus and all, uh, any particular features or things about Indiana State and uh, perhaps even Terre Haute at that time? It certainly changed a lot. Oh, since. yeah. We'd go on our, our we had uh, days when you had a float class mm -hmm. and we didn't meet that day. And my friend Carolyn and I would go downtown and grab some lunch. Um, and we never got out of the habit of walking like there was a fire, you know, because you got to get back for the next class. Uh, much, 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 obviously, much smaller campus. Where Homestead Hall is now was a parking lot. And that's where most of us parked. Um, and... Uh, when they were building Homestead Hall and we had to move down to where the new P.E. building, well, it's not new anymore, the P.E. building is now, yeah. we thought we had suffered a grave injustice. That's too far to walk. Oh. Um, the, um, what's it called? Student, Student Union, Union building, building was much smaller. We had 
many performances there that we were allowed, allowed to attend with our student identification and didn't cost us anything or much. And I can't remember the guy's name, but the guy who wrote The Music Man, all the music for it and the play itself, came to Indiana State and mm -hmm. did a presentation. And he told us how he took the same score, the same music basically, changed the rhythm and made it a different song. And he would sing them for us, you know. And so that was interesting. Um, and I loved science even at that point in time, so I was in for anything that we did in science. I guess your experience with Roots, Indiana State, and being in Terre Haute, I can remember, especially Christmas time, it was a jam of traffic oh. people and it, it was just something that you don't find or don't see today at all. There were no shopping centers. No. You were lucky to find a parking space on Ohio, not Wabash. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the professors that sticks out in my mind from Indiana State the most would be Dr. Hop. Yep. You remember seeing Dr. Hop yeah. on the television. That man had to have the most understanding wife in this world <laughs> because he was all over critters. Mm -hmm. He loved critters, and he had a, a boa that he brought into class one day, and I was a part of the front row, and he was, you know, looking at this snake. I grew up in Florida. I know from poisonous snakes. They, you know, this guy isn't poisonous, and I'm much too big for him to take a bite out of, so, you know, I'm enjoying <laughs> looking at him, and uh, I happened to glance around, and I was the front row. Everybody else had moved back. So I was up there all by myself. He typed our blood. We were studying a unit on the blood, and he typed our blood. And uh, this still sticks out in my mind. It was so funny. He had a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, he typed it, and he told me what it was. And it's no. Oh, and I said, good, I'm normal. And it, then he did the negative and positive test. And I was positive, and I said, wonderful, I'm normal, normal. He looked up at me and he said, young lady, we said nothing of your mental capabilities. We simply said you have O positive type blood. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, I loved it. Did you by any chance have a Dr. Margaret Rowe? She was in special education. I may have, but and she doesn't so stand out in my mind. A very dear friend of ours. Yeah, okay. I had some dandies. Oh yeah. Some that never should have been there. <laughs> Some that graded papers by the blue book, throwing it down the staircase. And the one that got the furthest down the staircase got the A. Mm -hmm. You know? There were those that were there, and you shouldn't have had them. Um, my husband and I divorced in 76. Um, we're good friends. We just, it just didn't work. We'd fought this for 16 years, and it wasn't getting any better. And so we divorced, and I continued to teach and stay in the house that we had built. Uh, we had a camper. He took the camper and lived in the camper. And when we came before the judge for the divorce, he said, I have never in my years on the bench seen a more equitable settlement than this. That's great. So that made that you feel kind of good. But it's still, it's like 16 years of your life didn't happen, yeah. you know? You look at the kids and say, well, yeah, it did happen. But it's, it's a different experience. Um, I didn't date. I just stayed home and took care of my kids. I was pretty much wounded. Um, so uh, about seven years later, six years later, a few years later, uh, when my son was a senior, I wanted to move closer to Ernie Pyle School because it was a half hour drive for me from West Tate where we lived. Um, so I wanted to keep him in the West Vigo School District, but I wanted to move closer to school. And my realtor was fortunate enough, God love her heart, she was going door to door in areas north to see if anybody had a house for sale. And she came to this one house and because my house had sold, oh. I had to get out. Ooh. 
and I had no place to go. Uh, at that point in time, I still had, let's see, Diana was out of the house, but I still had Donna and Kevin. Um, and she was going door to door to see if anybody had a house to sell. Ran across this family whose mother had fallen and broken a hip. She was in her 80s. They knew she couldn't live alone mm -hmm. anymore. And they were just talking about what they were going to do with the house. And she fell right into that. I fell right into it in that they let me move in before the papers were signed, before wow. the inspection was done, with the understanding that I not do anything to it. Hey, that's fine. It I usually doesn't some, happen that way. <laughs> no. I even bought some furniture. Beautiful rocking chair I brought from her. Um, never met the mother. But uh, anyway, so I bought the house and um, moved up to Libertyville. I say Libertyville is 30 houses and a closed grocery store. Not very big. Um, two churches. I had an uh, acre and a half and a four-room walk-around, which, of course, having helped mom and dad build houses when I was growing up and then building the one we built for ourselves, this was nothing for me. When the realtor would take me to look at houses, she'd say, now, I know this doesn't fit what you need, but I wanted you, you know, it's a possibility. I wanted you to see it. Well, when we're coming up to it, I can look at the roof line and say, yeah. okay, this is this is the main supporting wall you got in some here. vision. Of yeah. So I won't do anything this way, but I could do things this way, mm -hmm. move walls this way. And uh, she said, every real estate company needs somebody like you working with them because people won't buy it if it's not painted the right color. Yeah. So, uh, but I enjoyed that experience, and you know, so we changed that from a four-room walk-around. Um, it had what they called the summer kitchen. You remember mm -hmm. summer kitchens? Uh, no bathroom. It had a commode on this side of a hallway with a curtain across it, and the commode was behind a hot water heater. And on this side of the hallway, there was a lavatory. And then there was a summer kitchen here. So we took the summer kitchen, closed it off of the kitchen, opened it up on the hallway, and made a bathroom because it happened to be five and a half feet wide. That's good. So it fit a tub and made a wonderful bathroom. Dad said, I know how much you love, he was over there helping me, and he said, I know how much you love your bath, son. He said, what do you want me to start on first? Do you want me to start on the plumbing first or the wiring first? I said, Dad, the wiring could burn us down. Let's start on the wiring. I can make it without the plumbing. <laughs> so uh, one day I heard Kevin and Dad just chuckling away in the, it was a hip roof. Okay. Just chuckling away up there. And I thought, what in the world? And they came down and Damien, they had this rat's nest that you couldn't have laid on the table of wiring where Okay, this wire went from here to here. Well, I want an outlet or a, a, another light over here. So they bared the wire and just ran it over and down. <laughs> it was a mess. Uh, and that's what they were chuckling at, was this rat's nest of wires. And so I was so glad I told him to start on the wiring. It's a wonder you didn't have a fire. Yes. They didn't have a fire in the building. Yes, it is. <clears throat> it had a chimney <clears throat> in the center that was on an angle so that you could have a vent in each room ways. for a little stove. Uh, my son, God loving, tore that down from roof, clear through the attic, and clear down below the floor. Messy job. Oh, terrible job, terrible job. So you went from living room to bedroom to bedroom to kitchen. So we closed this off, made a hallway, and had living room, bedroom that came off the hallway, bedroom that came off the hallway and the kitchen. So it wasn't big, but it suited what we needed. And uh, I loved that little house. Sold it to the people that I thought would take care of it, and they didn't, and that makes me mad. Anytime somebody doesn't take care yeah. of something that I put some work into, it makes me mad, but it's not mine. Dwight used to say, honey, it's not yours anymore. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I know, but I know. Blood, sweat, and tears went into that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, during that time, I met Doyd. And I could have told you by the second date, 
that that was somebody I wanted to be with. Just something about him. And he had just come off of a lot of rough times. People in Marshall know Doy. They know he'd been through a lot of rough times. Um, and he'd just come out of that. And he said to me, if you'd met me six months ago, you wouldn't have had anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. So that's how close we were to not being a couple. Um, we married in June of 82. Unfortunately, in April of 82, my son committed suicide. And left me to find him in the house. <laughs> that poor operator. We had West Harrow's address and Indianapolis phone number. And I picked up the phone and all I could do was scream. And I feel so sorry for that poor operator. You know, in retrospect, trying to figure out what in the heck is going on. Mm -hmm. Why can't I get this person to talk? It was just a bad experience. One I wouldn't want to repeat. Uh, shortly after Doit and I married, my elder daughter Diana was in a little car accident and she talked to me. She said, Mom, I'm fine. I, this dog was hit and I turned around to come back to help the dog and this guy hit me. And uh, I said, that's fine, but I wouldn't believe it until I saw her. You know, having just been through that. Uh, Doyt and I lived in a little house he had down here on Chestnut Street. It was his uh, Aunt Lizzie's house. And he had taken care of his Aunt Lizzie. And uh, it was the only house I ever lived in where I could weed the bathroom. Where you could what? Weed the bathroom. I thought that's what you said. It was a wartime house. And they built it on, on uh, railroad ties. Yeah. So the walls just kind of separated. I could mop the floor in the kitchen, throw a little water over here and chase it across the floor. <laughs> the floor, the floor mopped. Oh, but it was dry and clean. Clean when I got there. Um, <laughs> but um, in December then, we were married in June, in December we bought what he called the funny farm. And that was Earl and Pearl Yargis' old house uh, out in the country on uh, the road that takes you down to Mill Creek Dam and the cabins. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was uh, just a little old farmhouse, story and a half, had the old single copper wiring in it. So that got remodeled. Uh, the upstairs wasn't usable as it was, it had been, but it had four chimneys up through the roof that didn't go anywhere on the, in the upstairs. So I climbed up on the roof, I was in my 50s at that point in time, I climbed up on the roof and took down those four chimneys and roofed over them. We never had a leak. Um, what did you do with all the brick? That and the brick I found in the yard, you know, because bricks are everywhere out there. Yeah. Became edgers around my fire pits. Put an edger uh, and yeah. raised it and poured hand poured concrete clear around and set those bricks upright on those that concrete. And I poured I set the bricks back far enough that I could get the wheel of the lawnmower up on the concrete. Yeah. Gotta think. For edging. Gotta think. So um, we lived there for about twenty or twenty one years. And, of course, Doit was a smoker, and the poor guy could not give up his cigarettes. And his health just kept getting worse and worse and worse. When we moved out there, of course, he'd helped his father and his Uncle Darrell, both, truck farm. Hmm. And so he thought we needed a garden that would feed Cox's army if they ever stopped by. <laughs> and it would have. They didn't. Um, and you know when things come ready to be canned and processed, I'm back in school. So it was not a good scene. But he could help a lot and did a lot then. 
Now, did you teach any here in the Marshall system? I subbed here after I quit teaching. Okay. But I subbed here and enjoyed that too. Yeah, I retired in, in 95, took two years off to kind of get my balance back, uh, see what I wanted to do, and uh, applied for a subbing license and I subbed for 12 years. Okay. So, everything from the high school down to kindergarten. I subbed for Daryl Lee Smith in kindergarten one afternoon. And Damien, it was the longest two weeks of my life. <laughs> I'm not built for kindergarten. Some people are, oh and I praise them. Oh, I have to give them a big gold star. Oh, yes. Uh, I, when I left the building, said, Lord, get me back to the land of the big people. <laughs> so, hormones were better than, she's not supposed to be there, and her feet are in my way. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> I ended up uh, subbing for a month here in Marshall in the third grade for a teacher who had to have some surgery and she got some infection so she was out longer than she thought she was going to be. So I subbed for her for a month, third grade. So that was interesting. It was be like being back full time again. <laughs> that long, yes, yeah. same class. Yeah. Um, but Doyce Health kept declining. And we had three acres, almost three acres. Uh, Charlie Stone had the farmland around us, okay. and he had a barn lot and a barn there. And I just mowed his barn lot for the heck of it. You know, I'm mowing what's, what's another hour. Um, and he appreciated it. And so he started cleaning up his barn lot, you know, really got it to where it was looking good. Um, and I had talked to him about it before I did it. I just go over on his property and start mowing. Um, and he said, well, you yeah. know, I said, there's a lot of stuff there. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll stay away, you know, so, but we got along fine. Um, and I loved that house, remodeled that house. And uh, as Doyd's health got worse and worse, he couldn't help with the mowing. He couldn't help with the garden. I'd cut the garden down twice, once in half and again in another third. Um, so I knew something was going to have to be done, and I loved being out in the country. I love to this day feeding the wild birds, oh, yeah. um, and I had so many that I was asked to do the winter bird count for the Audubon Society. So, but they won't stay still; they just keep moving around. Um, so uh, we finally decided we had to sell that place. And we had an auction. Started at nine o'clock in the morning, and we were still going at five that afternoon. Um, my son had had a ball card collection, and Dwight got to seeing how much some of those ball cards were worth, and he started collecting. We had a five shelf shelving unit, and Kevin's cards took up one shelf. Dwight's cards took up the other four in the top. So, <laughs> we sold a lot of cards. I think so, my goodness. <laughs> but we had things, of course, he'd worked for the railroad, and uh, uh, he'd had his own business. He uh, stripped and repaired and restored mm -hmm. furniture. Um, and so, he'd, somebody bring in a piece they wanted to sell, and he'd be gonna refinish it, and he'd say, oh, Teach, I'm gonna bring that home. He always called me Teach. I said, I'm going to bring that home. That'd be perfect here. I said, you're going to have to find a place for it, dear. We're running out of room for furniture. So uh, we had things everywhere. We had five flatbed trucks, wagons, with stuff on them. We had things all over the yard. This guy came up to me about 8.30 in the morning, and he said, uh, what do you want for that mirror over there? And I said, I don't know. He said, you don't know, isn't it yours? I said, yes, it's mine, but I don't know what it's going to bring. The auction doesn't start until 9 o'clock. He said, auction? I thought this was a yard sale. There is a difference. Oh, <laughs> uh, we'd have been selling for five years. Good grief. Anyway, we had our auction, and we moved 
a modular in down here across from South School. Um, and that's where I live now. That's where he passed away. He wanted to be home, so he passed away there. And that's where I live now. And he kind of lives there with me. Sure. Did you keep any of the ball or the cards? I have my son's cards, and I gave what wasn't Doit didn't want to sell. I gave to his son Mark to oversee. Um, and of course, I think everybody knows Doit's kids. Well, they may not. But they know Joyce because she lives here and taught here. She just retired. Joyce Lewis. Yeah. Um, married to David Lewis. Mm -hmm. To George. Um, and that was funny too because I had I'd never been called for jury duty, and I thought, you know, I'm a citizen. It's my duty to be serve on a jury at some time. Why haven't I ever been called? So I was called, and they asked if we had anybody in the police force, and I said, no, I don't have anybody in the police force. And then I thought, oh, but there is David, and he was state's attorney at that time. <laughs> so I called the clerk over, and I said, you know, they ask about police force, and oh, I didn't think about David, and she said, I'll tell the judge. So I was dismissed ceremoniously, or unceremoniously, and was uh, never asked to serve on jury duty again. Good that's, enough, right? That's the end of that. <laughs> His eldest son, Mike, uh, went right from high school to the Navy, and he was in the Navy for 23 years. They live out in the state of Washington on Whidbey Island, which is just off Seattle. Um, and then he had uh, Julie and Mark. So he stayed with the J's and the M's. I stayed with the DL's. I had Diana Lynn, Donna Louise, and if Kevin had been a girl, she was going to be Deborah Lee. I figured, hey, I got it going. I might as well keep going. Of course, as far as national events, and this is kind of funny too, because a lot of sixth graders don't like history. They don't like social studies. That's true. I didn't like it. I understand. Um, but now I understand that it's just something that people live through. You know, there's people that go through these. And so I would say, well, you remember when President Kennedy was killed? Oh, yeah, uh -huh. they could relate to that. And I'd say, well, these days your kids are going to come home and say, mm -hmm. oh, we had to study about that dumb Kennedy and his assassination. Why do we have to study about that? I said, you're going to say, wait a minute, I lived that. Mm -hmm. I was around when that happened. Well, the funny part is, one year I said that, and they looked at me like I just landed from some foreign planet. <laughs> and I calculated for a moment and said, of course you don't, you were three. <laughs> you know? So that line wasn't working anymore. <laughs> and we were, of course, we remember 9 11 and, and all that, uh, the missiles in Cuba. Been through that, and, and one of the reasons that my son committed suicide was he was a little old man when he was a kid. He was a 90-year-old, 9-year-old. Uh, listening to the news, within his capabilities, reading the paper, uh, worrying about what was happening in the mm -hmm. world. And the kids would come over and say, hey, you want to play some ball? And he'd say, yeah, but do you know how many missiles Russia has aimed at us? Sure. You know, yeah. he, he was really seriously worried about it. Um, and how to defend the country. Um, and no 16, 17, 18 year old should have to be in that spot. So. Betsy, we've all got so many modern conveniences and stuff around us. Is there something that you just say, I just couldn't live without that? Oh my, <laughs> my washing machine. <laughs> and I have used a ringer washer. Mm -hmm. And I heated water when we had the little garage house. I heated water and carried it out to the tubs. And my washing machine sat on a back porch, when it, an open back porch when it wasn't in use. Um, I hung diapers on the line when they froze before they ever started drying. So yes, my washing machine. I would definitely have to have that. I don't mind hanging clothes on the line. I like that. I think they smell good. But 
I need the washing machine. When you first moved to Marshall, I don't know, maybe you've been over here some, but is there something you said I just love about Marshall or dislike about Marshall? No, well, what loved, really was your first impression? Of I loved here? it right from the beginning. Um, Tom's Restaurant. Doyd took me there, one of our first places to go was Tom's Restaurant, and I had his tenderloin and onion rings. <laughs> Thought I'd wow. died and gone to heaven. So good. Um, the Colonial Kitchen had great food. Martin's Drugstore. You could still get a phosphate. Oh, you could yeah. sit at the counter and have it. Too. Yes, yes. And one of my jobs in high school uh, in the summer was a, a soda jerk. <laughs> and uh, the pharmacist and this guy were real good friends, and the guy came up and he said, He'd been talking to the pharmacist. He came up and he said, I'd like a chocolate shake. So, yes, sir. Mix it up with a chocolate shake. Get it ready for him. He lays a $100 bill down on the counter. I'd never seen one before. And I said, sir, I don't know that I can make change for that. And I look up at the pharmacist and he is just almost doubled over laughing. He's put him up to this. So, <laughs> he took the hundred dollar bill back and gave me the change. I think it was twenty five cents. <laughs> and talking about places to eat and soda fountains and all, I remember so vividly the Gillis Drugstore on the corner of Sixth and Wabash that had the balcony restaurant upstairs. Oh yes. I bet you do too. And the Rose Dispensary building. Oh yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Hedges was here. I bought some clothes at Hedges. Mm -hmm before they went away. And the Chinese restaurant used to be the Five and Dime store. Caldwell's. Mm -hmm. That man fussed and fussed and fussed about Walmart coming in here and gonna do them in, but he never modernized his wares. I mean, he was still trying to sell the same things he sold in the 30s. Nobody's buying that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, God love him. I felt sorry for him. Betsy, I've enjoyed this so much. And there's usually one question that I ask people who are kind of beginning to wrap things up. If you're in some other part of the country, or maybe another country, and you said, I'm from Marshall, Illinois, and they'd look at you and say, where on earth is that? And what's that all about? What would you tell them about Marshall and why they might want to visit here? I'd tell them it's a wonderful little community with friendly people. It's a nice place to live. Well, that's... I was, it, at one point in time, I thought when I retired, I wanted to buy houses that needed some TLC and remodel and sell. And unfortunately, between the time I had that thought and the time I actually retired, a lot of people from a lot of other areas found that Marshall was a lovely place to live too, and so they came and bought those houses that I would have remodeled and sold. <laughs> <laughs> so that took care of that. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're enjoying retirement. I guess, do you still do some gardening? And, uh, oh dear, I, I thought have so. six flower beds and a coil. I thought so. I drive by there and see some beautiful posies out there. Yeah, yeah. You have to come around sometime to see my koi pond. Uh, put that in with a little bit of help. And I started out with, I just wanted the sound of water. So a little waterfall and uh -huh. just a little basin. And I throw in a cup of goldfish. Well, that's nice. Maybe I'll go a little larger. I'm not doing anything to this one except the waterfall. I'm going to improve the waterfall because I want more sound from the waterfall. Wow. So with the help of my two daughters and their husbands and my grandson, who's a horse, um, I'll get that done one of these days when everybody has time. But because of Doit, I'm I've got... Ten grandchildren, one through blood, and, uh, nine through love, and thirteen great grandchildren. Oh my! You and have ten, ten. grandchildren. Mm -hmm. One and of them is Doctor Meredith Larson. Uh huh. I saw that in the paper. Yes. What a wonderful! I told her she needs to hurry because I need her. I'm falling apart. Thirteen great grandchildren. Okay. Yeah. And three of them are through blood, and the others are through love. I got very lucky. Betsy, this has been a delight. I sure appreciate your time and your sharing. And I've always said these 
oral histories are not so much for people looking at today, tomorrow, or even next week, but are really for the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some people are going to say, gee, I didn't know that about Betsy. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet there are with Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoyed this and uh, I just appreciate your, your time so much.